give up. Don't give up. Fight forever. Don't give up. Fight forever. Don't give up. Fight forever. Fight forever and ever and ever and ever. The following content has been produced for the exclusive enjoyment of you, the subscribers of High Spots TV, and is made possible by your support. We ask that you do not redistribute the content to any other websites or message boards. Thank you for your cooperation and support. Welcome, fans of High Spots TV, and uh, subsequently the DVD release on HighSpots.com. Today we're here with uh, Mark Jindrak, Marco Corleone. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you uh, in town with us today. Thank you. Uh, before uh, we talk about wrestling, which is going to be you know ninety nine percent of this interview, I want to just get a little more about your background and your upgrade uh, upbringing. Can you tell us maybe your athletic background even before you got into pro wrestling? Oh well, well when I started as a child, I did. I was a big fan of professional wrestling, and uh, but I was more of a fan of. I grew up in Auburn, New York, which is about twenty minutes from Syracuse, New York, and. Uh, a big basketball fan and a uh, big wrestling fan. Um, basically, I went on to play college basketball at a place called Cuca College, which is a Division II school outside of um, Rochester, New York. And basically, I stayed there until my sophomore year, which was, I think, was 97. And then when I was a sophomore going to my junior year, I actually moved down to uh, Florida, Orlando, Florida, with some of my teammates on the basketball team who had actually graduated and they were going to start their careers. So that's how I got into basically the professional wrestling. The, uh, As you know, back in the late 90s, WCW filmed their TV at Universal Studios. And uh, I met some wrestlers in a, in a restaurant one time, Alex Wright and Barry Houston. And basically that's how I found out about the power plant. But what, what were you doing at the time when you moved to Florida? Nothing. I was absolutely doing nothing, just hanging out. Two of, my, two of my friends moved down there to start their careers. I figured it would be a great plan to come down there for a summer, Orlando, Florida. And uh, I ended up going back to school after that. <laughs> so basically, uh, nothing, just messing around. You know, young, young, uh, young guy just wanted to see different parts of the world. What did you study when you were in college? Marketing. I was a marketing, marketing, marketing major. And, uh, you know, and I, I'm glad I did because I, I, did, I did pay attention. I did learn some stuff about marketing. And I think it's very important. Uh, in our careers as wrestlers, because it's, it's it's very, very much self marketing. You know, marketing marketing your character, marketing your gimmick. You know, whatever, whatever uh, clothes, design, whatever goes along with your character. You know, and and so I've I've used a lot of that over over the years. Hey, you mentioned it was just a circumstantial meeting with uh, Alex Wright. Well, actually, actually, what happened? I was actually work. I was working at this restaurant. I should let me clarify. I was working at the restaurant. I stated, um, you know, I moved down, I drove down a U-Haul truck, my friend's U-Haul truck, so it was basically, I was going to hang out in Orlando, they had a sweet pad, they had a, a pool and everything, you know, uh, so I figured, you know, what the hell, I'm going to go down there and, and check it out, so since I didn't have a car, I actually got a job close by, and it was, it was waiting tables at a Denny's, <laughs> and, uh, you know, this was outside of SeaWorld, so I was working the graveyard shift, um, because I wanted weekends off, and uh, so I worked a graveyard shift, and, and one particular night, it's actually a night that kind of changed my life, because in this particular night, I was uh, I was waiting tables, it was, it was maybe four in the morning, and nobody was in the restaurant. Myself, the dishwasher, and the cook was in the restaurant, and I, was, I think I was vacuuming at the time. And uh, earlier that night, Barry Houston, a guy named Barry Houston, um, which you may or may not know, but uh, and Alex Wright, who's more of a notable name, they came into the restaurant, and you know we we shot the shit a little bit and we talked and they asked me you know man you got a pretty good physique would you play sports I'm like yeah I'm a basketball player and and I'm just down here for the summer and and Barry Houston had actually asked me you know have you ever thought about wrestling you know do you like wrestling I was like well you know I watched it when I was younger in the Hulk Hogan Big John Studd Iron Sheik days but uh, I'm kind of out of it now you know so I I think I'm going to uh, you know I'm I'm just going to continue playing basketball and stuff and they said well you know you know 
here's my number, here's my car. If you ever want to try out, give it a try. You know, there's a great school in Atlanta called the WCW Power Plant, and I can tell you how to get in there. And I was, at this point, I was over the whole wrestling thing. You know, I went from liking professional wrestling, but then once I hit puberty, girls and you know, Sega Genesis took over, <laughs> and uh, that was it. So but you probably didn't even know who Alex Wright was. I didn't. I did not know who Alex Wright was. I and, and nor nor. Uh, um, Barry Houston, right? But you know, two two good, two decent guys, two guys in shape, and um, honestly, at the time, I was always one of these guys who, like, I would look at other guys and say, "Wow, you know, if he's doing that. You know, I I can do that." You know, and and that's kind of the impression I got. You know, because phys physically, I think at that time, maybe I was nineteen, maybe twenty years old, maybe, and uh, physically, uh, you know, Alex Wright's a big guy in a in a. Um, you know, tall and, and athletically built, but uh, you know, at the time, even at the time, you know, when even when I wasn't much into working out, I I still, you know, I felt like my athletic prowess was was equally or better compared to those guys. So I was, and, and I saw those guys pulling out and they're dr driving like Cadillacs and stuff, and I was like, man, maybe I gotta forget about this college college budget and stuff and and look into this, but. You know, I was always a basketball player at heart. That was my passion, basketball. And I was under the, uh, the influence, or the belief that I was going to make something in my life in basketball. You know, I never thought maybe NBA, but I always thought that maybe playing in Europe or overseas, you know, is a possibility of furthering my basketball career. But anyway, so basically I, I uh, ba basically Barry Houston's offering of, you know, helping me get into the power plant was kind of a whatever, thanks a lot, but I'm a basketball player. So they left that night. And later that night, at like four in the morning, like I said, it was only myself, the cook, and the, um, the dishwasher. I'm 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 vacuuming stuff, and uh, I see this kid come in with a baseball cap on, a New York Mets baseball cap. I'll never forget it. And he says to me, "Hey, you got four quarters for a dollar?" And I was like, "Yeah, sure." So as I'm opening the drawer, I see two more guys come in. They both have pipes, and all of a sudden, this guy with the the Mets hat pulls out a gun and points it at my head, and he's like, uh, "Give me all the money." And I was like. I don't, want, I don't want nothing, you know, and, and it was kind of a surreal feeling because I was getting held up and, you know, I, I was a young kid from Syracuse, you know, I wasn't exposed to any kind of stuff, you know, like all my life and, and now, you know, in bigger cities when there's more crime and stuff, that's what I ran into. And so when it was all over, they took the money and left, no no harm, no foul. And, uh, but it kind of, I was like, wow, you know, it blew me away. The cops did all the reports and stuff. I ended up going back to my apartment complex and, uh, I wanted to tell my buddy, you know, he was sleeping for work, and I was like, man, and I was like, you know, I'm gonna wait till he gets up. So I went to the hot tub and pool in my my complex there, and who do I see? This guy Barry Houston again, because his girlfriend was staying there. That's where his girlfriend lives, and they're in the pool drinking and messing around, and 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 basically that's where we further talks about the professional wrestling. Small world. Small world, yeah. So how long was it uh, between that meeting and when you actually made the decision to? Uh try your hand at wrestling well when i told him about the story what happened that night he was he was like wow you know and kind of used that as a point as a, to say well, look you know life is short you know you know do you want to be a you know a, a division two basketball player and maybe play in europe one day and, and and work at denny's or do you want to go for it you know and, and he gave me all the information on the power plan i was like you know what the hell with it because i can't i can't live i can't live thinking what if and uh so basically the next day they were filming in Universal Studios, and he told me, he gave me the whole brief run rundown of the power plant, Sarge, and all that stuff, and you know the squats and all that stuff, and the physical, the physicalities of it. And uh, so he invited me down to the Universal Studios, and that's when it just, I fell in love. I mean, I, I went there, and I, I can remember walking around. Um, you know, I, I saw Hulk Hogan, I saw Goldberg when he was, you know, just kind of starting. Um, I saw guys like uh, Mr. Perfect. He was one of, my, one of my idols. Rick Rude. I loved Rick Rude too. You know, all those guys were at the talent of their careers there in WCW, and I'm seeing all those guys, and and uh, I'm thinking to myself, wow. You know, I saw Booker T and Stevie Ray, and 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 uh, I'm just blown away. You know, and that's when I just it, it just hit me, and I was like, wow, this is something I want to do. So I talked to Sarge. You know, he's he was kind of a quiet guy. You know, but I. He kind of told me, he goes, well, because, you know, if you come to this, this camp in Atlanta, you, you better be in shape. You know, and he said it pretty sternly. So I was like, of course, of course.
but just seeing all these guys. When I was walking away, walking walking out of Universe Studios, I saw Macho Man pull in in his, in his Benz, and I was, man, I was blown away, you know? And, uh, you know, you go from the 80s as a, a kid that loved wrestling to forgetting about it, but now the resurgence. At this time, too, wrestling started, was, this is the point, I think it was 90, uh, was it early 98. Wrestling was starting to get big again on TV. This is when the, the wars were kind of going on. WCW was hot, NWO, and, and on Monday nights, and, and I believe WWE was the, the lesser of the two at the time, you know, and and uh, but they were bringing up stars like The Rock, the Stone Cold, the, the, the guys like that, so it was a very interesting time for pro wrestling, and uh, pretty much I believe that the following month I went to, to the power plant and tried out for three days. It's just interesting because most wrestlers don't recruit their competition. No, they usually no. try to keep people away. And that's the business. thing. Barry Houston told me he, he told me, you know, he paid for my trout as well. Oh, wow. Barry Houston paid for my trout. Thank you, Barry. Um, and uh, he just, you know, he told me, he said, you know, it was just, it was somebody in my t point in my career that put me onto the business and got me involved. And and uh, I just wanted, he always told me to, if I had the chance to do it, to, you know, to get somebody else, put somebody else on and bring a good kid into the business who seemed like he was worthy of bringing in, to go and do it. And he told me, he passed the same thing on to me. And, uh, and uh, that's, that's basically how it happened, you know. So he paid for my tryout. He gave me the whole rundown. I met Sarge, met all the boys, you know, and, and uh, relinquished this, this love for wrestling. And I went to Atlanta, traveled from Orlando to Atlanta and, and tried out. I, I want to say it was September maybe of 98, mm -hmm. September of 98, or yeah, October, October of 98, September of 98, yeah. So you walk into the power plant, what's your first impression? So I walk in the power plant and uh, super, super nervous, but I was in super good shape as well. So, um, but just the awe of being in there, there was, I believe it was three or four rings in there. And, and, you know, of course, before I went to the power plant, like I, I, I got into the wrestling again. I mean, I was religiously buying the magazines for that month and watching the nitros every, every Monday. And man, I, I just, it was, it was, it was crazy, you know? And, and I was just, I just wanted to get my foot in the door. I wanted to get on TV. I, I, that was my new goal. You know, I forgot, I almost forgot about basketball. I just said the hell with it, you know, and and uh, so I get to the power plant, and that day, you know, there was probably 22 guys there, and uh, you know, guys of all uh, shapes and sizes, ex football players, ex military guys, um, really with no basketball players like myself, you know, but but I, I felt like I had the advantage because I was I was taller than most, and uh, apart from being, uh, I saw a lot of guys that were steroided up and stuff, you know, that really weren't weren't very mobile and that that's what helped me because you know when you're doing you're doing squats and you're doing running and then squats and push-ups and running and squats and and it just they try to mentally kill you first and the way to mentally kill you first is is basically by tiring tiring you out and all these guys that were carrying 20 to 30 extra pounds of water and steroid weight they these guys couldn't keep up you know like after 50 50 to 100 squats they're 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 ready to die you know and and uh Whereas me, you know, I, I do my squats, and yes, it was very, very difficult. But you know, when we go outside and start running, that's when you know, I run like the wind. So, so I started feeling, you know, uh, I was. Uh, it helped me, you know. We do the squats and then running, it kind of loosened me up. Where for the other guys, it was just the opposite. They do the squats, their legs will tighten up. They're trying to run outside, and it's just it's double whammies, you know. So, by the end of the first or second day, by the end of the first day, there was myself and two other guys left, and. Uh, so we went from 22 guys to three guys. Who were the other two? Um, one guy, his name was Charles. Uh, I can't remember his last name, but I remember his gimmick. He was Crack House Charles. <laughs> Hard Body Harrison. Hard Body Harrison put him on, <laughs> who's now in jail. Um, and the other guy was uh, a Chinese guy uh, who actually ended up staying as well at the power plant. I forgot his. I forget his name as well. It's been so long, but. Uh, but basically, at the end of day two, it was myself and two other guys, and, and that they stayed like that in day three also. So, when the when the training camp got done, um, I went to Jody Hamilton's office, uh, the assassin, and he sat me down. He said, "You know, he goes, I, I think you're very athletic, and I think, uh, you know, you have a decent future in this business." He goes, "How would you like to? We'd like to invite you back, and you know, and, and join the camp, you know, basically." And and uh, 
at that point in time at the power plant, uh, that's when at the whole time that my whole group, my whole group of friends, who I'm still friends with most of them, were all joining the power plant as well. Guys like Johnny the Bull or Relic now, um, Alan Funk or Chi Chi now, uh, Elix Skipper, um, God, who else? Chuck Palumbo, uh, Rick Rick uh, Rick Reno Reno. Uh, Reno, Reno, um, who else? God, there's so many of them. Um, but basically, that was uh, Sonny Siaki, Mike Sanders. Um, but that was my crew. That was my group, and uh, that's who I became friends with and broke in the business with, you know. And that that was pretty much the crew that we we had at the time for the until we got the TV, and and uh, it was kind of nice because those guys became my friends, and and always, you know, especially in a power plant under the tutelage of of you know, Sarge or um, guys like that, and later Paul Orndorff. You know, it's just difficult. It's very, very difficult. And when you're when you're joining, um, taking on something new like that, um, like a first day of school or something, it's always easier to be with a bunch of friends because it makes it a little easier. And that's kind of like the my beginning, my first my first entrance in the business, myself and pretty much the friends that I made. How long were you in the power plant before you had your first opportunity on TV? Well. I had my first opportunity on TV right away, but not in a wrestling sense. Um, what had happened was, as soon as I started the power plant, maybe a month or two in, what they started doing was bringing, uh, got a cut, they took a couple guys, which I believe they sent myself, Elix Skipper and Mike Sanders, I want to say, to uh, Nitros, Nitros and Thunders, to do basically TV security, basically to do... Uh, um, you know, little skits. I can remember, you know, a couple months into the power plant, you know, me, me getting to fly up to Nitro and doing a skit where, you know, I'm laying on the ground because Hulk Hogan hit me with a garbage can or something, you know, like that, that to me was incredible because, and, and right away, you know, for, for me to shut down a dream of playing basketball, I went from this basketball player into college basketball into, well, I'm not going back to school, mom and dad, I'm going to, I'm going to join wrestling, which they, which actually they banned when I was little because my brother and I used to wrestle and he hit his head on a dresser one time and so we, were, we weren't allowed nobody any more wrestling. That had a lot to do with um, not watching wrestling anymore either. Um, and my parents just weren't big on it. And, uh, well, you must have loved the decision for you not to go back to school. Huh? Exactly. And, 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 and more so to become a wrestler, so, which they knew nothing about. And they only knew what they remembered as, as children, you know, the trouble we're getting into, the injuries, hitting each other and stuff. And, uh, and uh, you know, basically that was... To be on TV that quick, even in that form, was you know, call my mom and say, "Hey, tonight I'm going to be on TV. You know, check me out." And and it gave them a little more um, hope in my decision, you know, and and uh, and everyone and friends, everybody, you know, and and uh, and honestly, too, one thing is like, it's kind of like you know, which we'll get to later, but you know, like speaking Spanish, you know, like one thing is taking classes in the United States and taking three or four years of Spanish classes and trying to learn the language. And another thing is just putting yourself right in Mexico, being enthralled in it, you know, and that's basically what happened with WCW. Yeah, I was in the the power plant and stuff, but to be there the few months in to see, you know, there was times in nitro crowds in front of 12,000 people where I'm sitting right on ringside at the gate, you know, be, just being wrestler, wrestler uh, wrestling, regular wrestling security, but to watch these matches live, you know, right right there, it, it, you learn a lot from it, you know, and a lot of guys took me under uh, their wing and, and took kindly to me, you know, like, uh, Kurt Henning was one of them, you know, I can remember vividly, you know, like, uh, um, coming, I think it was Tampa, you know, they'd always party at the hotel bar afterwards, and, and uh, I'd always like to try and, you know, weasel my way into the party, you know, and, and not just be, be on the outside looking in. And, and one time, uh, Kurt Henning's big thing was the, the gargle Jack Daniels. And, uh, he, you know, he basically took him under his wing, and he's like, hey, you know, uh, you seem like a good kid and stuff. You know, you, you, you remind me a lot of my uh, good friend. He was talking about Rick Rude. And to me, that was uh, the biggest honor ever because uh, Rick Rude was one of my favorites, favorite characters. Uh, one of my only uh, heel characters that I liked, Rick Rude, you know, with his whole gimmick with the with the dance and the, the, the airbrushed uh, pants and stuff. So I gargled a couple of shots with, with Kurt Henning, and, you know, that was that was the world to me, you know, and uh, that's basically how it started, you know, but, um, coming back and forth. I got in good with, like, with Jimmy Hart and guys like that in the office, and, uh, and 
basically that's that's going back and forth like that. When they put you uh, on TV and like the tag team that you formed with uh, Sean O'Hare, do you think looking back on it, it was too early, or do you? Well, uh, even before that, uh, we did a. Our, my first TV was with uh, Chuck Palumbo. Meanwhile, when this all was going on, you know, I had I kind of had my in now, you know, like talking to all these guys and stuff. And little by little, you know, being on the road, it was like I, f I felt like I was one of the boys mm -hmm. um, while learning at the power plant. So uh, the more I learned in the power plant, the more I learned how to wrestle, the more comfortable I felt being around these guys because in their presence, you know, like I was I was horrible. I was horrible at first. And, uh, you know, as I got better, you know, I learned to do a couple good things, like throw drop kicks or do this or do that. And, and uh, you know, these guys helped me out more. So Chuck Palumbo and I on the side, we started creating um, we started creating a tag team called the, we called ourselves the Soul Surfers. <laughs> it was more his idea. He's a San Diego boy. But uh, I liked it. You know, I, like, I thought Chuck Palumbo was great. He was tall, you know, good shape as well. And so I basically... Him and I started making this little tag team called the Soul Surfers, which we do in Independence, in in Atlanta. You know, we had a chance, and and then when I would go, we we have when once we felt like we were getting good enough where we could maybe be on TV and and not look like the complete shits, we uh, can we can we say shits? Sure. <laughs> okay. Okay. If I slip up on a swear word from time to time, uh, and so basically we we kind of created this tag team, um, and then I had the basic in. I, I'd go to TV every week and. You know, I could hand in photos, ideas, storylines, and the more, the more I got around these guys, the more they accepted these ideas. So finally, we uh, Chuck Palumbo and I did a photo shoot, and I, we made up this little this little uh, binder of photos. Uh, uh, and I went to, I went to Nitro that week, and he, I gave the pictures to Jimmy Hart, and Jimmy Hart said, "Wow, this is these are great, baby." You know, and and uh, Monday, of course, was Nitro. Tuesday was the the uh, thunder taping and then Wednesdays usually they had TV tapings and I believe uh, Rock Hill is close to here right mm -hmm. Rock Hill Rock Hill, North Carolina on Monday Jimmy said this is great we gotta bring you guys a TV where's, where's Ch Chuck Palumbo right now and I said he's at the power plant he's like let's get him up here let's have you guys do a match on Wednesday and I was like oh my god I called Chuck Palumbo told him we have a match and we had a match against a tag team called Disorderly Conduct mm -hmm. and uh, honestly it was the it was a drizzling shit. It was horrible. It was it was horrible, horrible, horrible. We weren't ready. We were, we were really, really green. It was a big wake up call. Um, but at the same time, it was uh, it was good to get that out of the way, you know. And uh, because from that point on, I knew exactly what we had to do in order what what we needed to be in t you know as far as TV, a uh, talent, and uh, maybe probably about. Even though that happened, they still had some promise in all the guys of the power plant, because the power plant before, before the reassert the surgeons of all of all of us, we all got contracts. The power plant was kind of a it was a, pre a prestigious school, but no one really came out of it. They'd always say that the big show came through there. He didn't. He was there for a little bit and he trained. Um, they say Goldberg. Goldberg came down there for a couple of days, discovered the jackhammer and the spear. And that was pretty much it. Other than that, who would really come out of the power plant and got a chance? Not not many guys. You know what I'm saying? They they had a a, a tag team called High Voltage, which they got a little burn for a while. Um, uh, Lash Larue was there. He was getting a little TV time, and Mike Sanders too got a little TV time as well. But besides those guys, the power plant was kind of a, a fluke, a joke. You know, I mean, a, a school where you go and pay money and you go through all this grueling crap for TV. You know, for for TV interviews and magazine interviews, how 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 you know stressful and strenuous and and vigorous the the workouts were with 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 WCW, but who really ever excelled and they ever got the TV? So um, I guess WCW at that time, you know, at that time maybe in ninety beginning of ninety nine, that's when the, the decline started. You know, they started going downhill, whereas WWE or WWF at the time started coming up. You know, and and. Uh, the roles were reversing a little bit, you know, and uh, and basically that they took the power plant as you know maybe the garden of, of seeds that it could grow into stars. And uh, in April of 1999 is when they all signed us. They signed uh, first they signed Chuck Palumbo and I, then they signed Sonny Siaki, Alan Funk, Elix Skipper, uh, uh, Rick Reno. Um, Amongst a couple other. When you say sign, you mean like multi-year? No, well, they signed this training. Basically, 
I signed a contract. I think I was making seven hundred fifty bucks a week, and uh, you know we're still at the power plant. But that was kind of like the they made the power plant more official. You know, before guys would come in at nine, train till eleven or twelve, one o'clock. Um, but then when when they started paying guys, that's when it became more of a you know like a, a work a job. And that's when they brought Paul Orndorff in. We moved power plants from the old power plant to the to where more of the offices were over. Uh, I think I remember one time. Uh, if you remember when DX was outside WCW, mm -hmm. um, that that building, that particular building right there, is where the the new power plant was. And state of the art. They built they built some. You know the facility facility was beautiful. Uh, that's where we started training under the tutelage of uh, Paul Orndorff, and uh, that's when it became basically a job. You know. Let's jump ahead to uh, being on TV and the tag team role you were in. Okay. Uh, well, the the, the tag, at that time. Uh, Shortly after us, shortly after that whole group was signing, uh, Sean O'Hare eventually came, and you know Sean O'Hare came in as he's six foot six, two hundred seventy five pounds, and very very acrobatic, doing backflips and stuff. And he signed very quickly. He was very green, but like uh, him and I became friends as well, and uh, um, we end up becoming. I was like a, I was kind of like a tag team prostitute. I was jumping from tag team partner to tag team partner. And I became, we, we, me and Sean O'Hare created a little tag team. And uh, again, you know, they, they liked our style. They liked, they liked the, two, the idea of two young guys uh, that flew around a little bit. They thought maybe, even though we were green, they gave us a chance on TV as well. And my, my first Nitro was uh, with Sean O'Hare on June 26th, year 2000. That was my, I know that date because that was my birthday, my 23rd birthday. And uh, we wrestled in De Des Moines, Iowa. Um, versus Juventud Guerrero and Rey Mysterio on Nitro, and they put us over. We won. So, uh, and I actually actually just watched that match probably a few weeks ago, and it's, it's crazy to watch that match. You know, like I, I had no idea. You know, when it happened, it was a blur. But you know, watching the TV, you know, watching watching what was going on in that match, it was it was crazy. You know, and and, and the fact the wrestling two guys like Rey Mysterio and Juventud Guerrero, two f super fast guys and lucha libre stars. Um, and that's when it all began. You know, we had a good match. We had a good match, and Sean O'Hare and I were on, on TV ever since. And uh, eventually, they they moved you to a tag team with Stasiak. Yeah, well, me, me, Sean well, O'Hare. What caused the change? Well, Sean O'Hare and I had a had a good tag team run, and uh, parallel with that, Sean Stasiak we would Chuck Palumbo as a tag team, and uh, we both had good tag team runs. You know, we we're in the same group, the Natural Born Thrillers, and. Uh, when WCW was kind of um, at its at its end, um, I believe I think maybe Bischoff or some other potential owners came in. And they kind of changed everything, and uh, the the office kind of changed things. and And basically, my tag team, you know, Sean O'Hare was more exp maybe I was maybe a better technical wrestler, but he was he was a freak of nature. Um, you know, he did that swanton uh, dive. He did backflips off the top rope. He he kind of wanted to stood out in our team tag team more, as Chuck Palumbo stood stood out in their tag team a little more. So they ended up putting those two guys together and put me and Stasiak together, and then we ran an angle with the, them and they ended up beating us. And uh, it was kind of the way it went, you know. Uh, and I understood because I was still young, very very green, and and still very uh, um, underdeveloped. You know, I was uh, at the time I was 23, going on 24, but I was still very underdeveloped. You know and Whereas Sean O'Hare was a little older than I, he had a, a major league body, freak of nature body, and and you know, and Chuck Palumbo uh, stood out in his tag team as well. They put them together and they put me together, together with Stasiak. But uh, nonetheless, it was that's what that's how that's how it went. Don't give up! Don't give up! Fight forever! Don't give up! Fight forever! Don't give up! Fight forever! Fight forever! And ever! And ever! And ever!